All right, guys, here we are again as we continue with our uh, contemporary uh, philosophers of significance, right? Contemporary, I'm going to show you this first slide here, contemporary Christian philosophers of significance. So having said that, we are now going to come up with or discuss arguably one of or again discuss we're going to the um most significant um contemporary uh christian philosopher um and that's going to be norman geisler phd now there are going to be many that would argue um that he is not as significant as he was in the past. And I think that for sake of argument, I think that we can concede that point. We can say, okay, sure. He's not necessarily as influential today um, as he was, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Um, But that's going to have to have a heavy qualification to that. So even those that would say he's not as influential you know, at, at the time of this recording, um, you're still going to have to qualify that and you're going to have to say that personally significant because it's just going to be completely and utterly false to say that he's not influential uh, influential at all. Um, and that's going to be for the following, uh, this, this, this following reason. If you've heard of or if you've been, in, been impacted by any of the philosophers that we have know that we have mentioned thus far in the course um if you've been impacted by any of those philosophers then you're going to have to say that norman geisler is influential or why because of the philosophers that we've noted each one of them um again go back through who we've discussed thus far each one of them was either taught by Geisler um, during their graduate programs or has specifically mentioned Geisler um, in their graduate programs or maybe not their graduate programs, but has mentioned Geisler in their work uh, at some point, whether it be um, their academic work, whether it be a presentation, whether it be a debate, whether it be a blog, somewhere they've all, they've mentioned and made reference uh, to Geisler, who has had some impact on them in some way. In fact, we know uh, that most notably out of the, those mentioned thus far, um, that Geisler was the instructor, the teacher, the professor of William Lane Craig. Right. So even if Even if you, you personally don't um, listen to Geisler or if you, you've read no material uh, from Geisler, um, if you've been impacted by William Lane Craig, um, then Craig was taught by Geisler. So you've been directly impacted there or indirectly impacted. However, there are others. If you've heard of or if you've been impacted by uh, Ravi Zacharias, uh, Ravi Zacharias was directly, excuse me here, um, directly under the impact of Norman Geisler because he, as well, um, was taught by Geisler in his own classrooms. In fact, um, I've heard both of uh, both Geisler and uh, William Lane Craig make mention of this fact that Ravi was in the classroom, right? Uh, studying and learning along with under Geisler's tutelage. Now, again, it's just, it's just honestly so hard to, to overstate um, the impact that this one particular uh, individual has had in the realm of philosophy of religion. Now, It's one of those things, too, where I could even add add my own personal story in regards to this. So if you've had 
obviously this class, if you're listening to this, then you're, you're most likely enrolled in the class. Um, but if you have had any other courses with me, um, a lot of my views were at first uh, expounded by or given by Norman Geisler. Um, Geisler had a, a massive role um, in my own uh, intellectual journey, in my own uh, spiritual journey, theologically and whatnot, um, as I began to doubt and seriously question uh, the validity of the Christian faith, um, as I began to really wrestle um, with all of the philosophical, um, what I saw problems with Christianity um, at the time, it was Geisler and those that were under his tutelage that really, really shaped my thinking and helped me go in a specific direction. Um, in fact, one of his students, as, as mentioned, Ravi Zacharias, who I really wrestled over including in this in this course lecture, um, because though he's not necessarily an academic, uh, strictly speaking, he's obviously a, a, a well-respected and um, genuinely impactful Christian thinker. Um, so just because he's not included in this course, don't think that I'm trying to sell someone like that short simply because they don't have the PhD at the end of their name um, or simply because they're, they're not, they don't hold an academic position. Um, Ravi Zacharias has been uh, hugely impactful. Um, and again, even in regards to my own life. So getting back to that, uh, it was, it was C.S. Lewis and a couple of books, uh, by Ravi Zacharias that when I was 19 years old, um, that really put me on a, on a, on a path of understanding and, and, uh, and engaging with the intellectual, um, heritage and tradition, um, of the Christian faith. And of course, again, that just comes back to, uh, Geisler here, who has, who was one of Zacharias's, uh, professors. In fact, when I would read the works of Zacharias, what turned me on originally to uh, Geisler, how I got into the works of Geisler um, was by reading the work of Zacharias and he would make reference to um, his professor on a on multiple uh, basis, you know, right. And so I would go and seek out those works and read those um, after having read the Zacharias material. Now, after that long introduction there, after that, uh, very long introduction. We can kind of move into some of the some of the material or some of the, the categories that we would normally discuss here. So nationality, um, again, another Anglo-American philosopher um, from the United States. Um, now, uh, regarding his background, how how he became interested in philosophy. Again, as we've mentioned previously, is like so many others that he. Um, if, you know, I, I may, you know, foul up some of the details. I don't think so. But if I recall correctly, he was uh, had been converted to the Christian faith, uh, was engaging in uh, evangelistic efforts, um, you know, witnessing door to door and uh, along the streets and whatnot. And he was confronted by a <laughs> Lack of better words, he was confronted by a drunk <laughs> individual who immediately went to uh, the Gospel of Mark, uh, asked Geisler why he was doing what he was doing, namely evangelism, telling people about Jesus. And um, the the uh, the drunk guy goes to the Gospel of Mark, flips to the certain you know chapter and verse where Jesus says, "You don't need to uh, tell anyone who I am. Keep this as a, a secret, right?" and challenges Geisler and says, look, see, you don't need to be doing this. Even your own text, your own, obviously a drunk guy probably didn't use that verbiage then, right? But he says, look, even your Bible says, you don't need to be going around telling people about Jesus. It says it right here in Mark, in the book of Mark, where Jesus told his disciples, don't tell anybody, right? And Geisler, uh, to his shame says, and I didn't know how to answer the guy. I didn't know what to do. I, I, I knew that he was somehow he was wrong. And I knew that I was supposed to be telling people about Jesus, but I didn't know how to answer him at all. And then I would get tangled up, you know, by uh, Jehovah's Witnesses or, or Mormons or, or these other uh, 
you know, counter Christian type uh, belief systems. Um, and I didn't know what to do with that. And so Geisler goes back to school, um, receives his undergraduate, receives his graduate degrees, and then finishes up his PhD at Loyola in philosophy. Uh, because obviously um, he, just like so many others, um, the questions that he struggled with, the questions that he found to be uh, the most profound were philosophical in nature, right, in, in some sense. And so, so just like so many others, uh, you know, I would have to throw myself into that boat as well, that this interest in philosophy um, and, and thinking about these deep questions as they pertain to God um, began as some sort of interest in apologetics probably like so many of you uh, in your class, um, and if not apologetics, maybe just philosophy of religion in general, at least the big questions, right, in regard to God and whatnot. Now, when we talk about the notable significant ideas, notable slash significant slash arguments, um, this is going to be one of the categories that it's going to be somewhat difficult, not because there's not something to offer here, um, because, but because there's so much, right? Geisler has been involved in so many um, arguments for the existence of God, so many um, endeavors, uh, so many ideas, um, that it's just going to be so hard to pick out um, just a couple of these. Now, Geisler was influential, again, in getting out some of these arguments, again, that may have been looked at as, as classical in some sense. So uh, cosmological types of arguments, moral types of arguments. Um, now, if we talk about this, this is where one of his ideas is significantly different than someone like William Lane Craig's. Um, Geisler doesn't necessarily take the route that if God doesn't exist, then objective moral values and duties uh, do not exist. Uh, tack there. Though he agrees with that argument. Geisler, because he leans Thomas, which we'll note in the school of thought here, he, he takes more of the route of natural law, um, revealing that there's a real right and a real wrong. And sort of like the C.S. Lewis kind of route that, um, that most people uh, know this, right? Now we could debate epistemologically how they know it, um, how it's written on the heart, so to speak. Nonetheless, he tries to argue that people know this and justifications, uh, excuses, uh, all of these sorts of things are what uh, give away that people know there's some sort of objective or, or absolute moral law in some sense. Now, he's also uh, known for, in, in regard to Christian ethics, for his stance on uh, what's called graded absolutism or um, uh, sometimes called hierarchicalism. Now, he is a deontologist in some sense, right? A, a, in the sense that um, your ethic, if you haven't had your, your ethics course yet, this may be a little different, difficult for you. But in the sense that it's not so much about the consequences that determine the right, uh, rightfulness or wrongfulness, right, of some particular moral act or behavior, but it's the principle uh, in question, right? So again, it's if we could sum it up with just kind of a cliche, it'd be you do the right thing right now and you let the consequences handle themselves. Or if you were to put a theological spin on it, it'd be something like, look, you do the right thing and you let God handle the consequences. You do what's right right now and you let God deal with uh, what may come about as a result of that, right? Now, when it comes to any deontological type ethical system, one of the objections and one of the problems with those types of systems are what we call moral dilemmas, right? The fact that you may have some moral absolute, because remember, deontology is supposed to give you moral absolutes. Um, it's supposed to give you that there are right things and wrong things to do uh, for certain, for, for all people at all places at all times, right? Um, and the problem with that is, well, if that's the case, if there are absolute rights and wrongs that are absolutely right or absolutely wrong um, at all places at all times for all people, well, what do we do when those absolutes come into conflict with one another? 
Um, again, if you've had an ethics course, you know that one of the options is to deny that there are any true, uh, if, if you do hold the moral absolutes, the, 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 one of the ways out of that is they deny that there are any real moral dilemmas, that there just really are no moral conflicts once you get down to it. Geisler takes a more, uh, I would say, real approach and says, no, yes, there can be genuine moral dilemmas. Uh, sometimes to, moral absolutes do come into conflict, and we have to have some way uh, to try to work with that. What do we do when that happens? And so one of his significant ideas or one of his arguments here that he's given is what's called graded absolutism. Now, there's so much that could be said for that because it does really try to, first, it genuinely acknowledges that there really are moral dilemmas, right? So you can not, you can just act like they don't exist. You can say, well, you choose the lesser of the two evils, which is just very odd, right? Um, again, if you've had the ethics uh, course, this right here will be, uh, this little point will be a refresher. But if not, um, one of the problems with saying, well, in a fallen world, you're going to have absolutes that come into conflict with conflict with one another and you just got to choose the lesser of two equals. Um, and the problem with that is you're essentially claiming that you have a moral obligation to do that, which is immoral, which is contradictory, right? In, in some sense, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to hold up to rational scrutiny. Um, when we start to uh, cash it out in those terms, when we start to strip away the, the uh, rhetorical flash of do the less of two evils, um, it doesn't even seem to make sense because you're morally obligated to do the immoral. But if you're morally obligated to do the immoral, that means you do the immoral and you're not moral. But if you're moral for doing the immoral, then you can't be immoral because you're doing the moral, right? You, you see the problem there? Um, so his system here called graded absolutism tries to uh, give you an account on how, how we can do this. So if you think, think of, a, of a triangle, right? And you, I know this is a terrible example of a triangle, but it's the best I can do right here. Um, if you think of a triangle, you have up here where the tips of my fingers are, something like fidelity to God, right? That might be the moral absolute under uh, um, that, that, that takes precedence over all others, right? Um, so, for instance, like, uh, you know, I can either, um, you know, obey the law of my, gov my law of the land. And let's say the, the, the country in which I live says you can't talk about Christ um, to, to other people, you must deny your faith. If they ask, well, you know, I do have a moral obligation according to the scriptures, right? To obey my government. However, if it comes into conflict with this moral obligation of being faithful to God, um, then I have to be faithful to God. And this moral absolute, uh, has to merge. If they come into conflict, it has to merge behind this absolute, right? So if they ever come into conflict, it has to merge. Now, the question is, well, how is that not still relative in some sense, right? Well, because remember, let's say you have here at the tip, um, fidelity to God. So here you have, again, you can work out how, I mean, we could go through a whole ethics class on how you'd work this out, but something like fidelity to God, something like um, protecting laws of innocence, something like um, truth telling, something like stealing. I mean, again, we can work that out however, but you notice these, the, the order never changes. So they're not relative. They will never flip, right? The, the, the order of these absolutes will never flip. They will never be reversed. They will never be put in a different order. Um, they're always truly right, truly wrong for all people at all places at all times. It's just when they come and in, come into conflict with another absolute that's higher on the grade, they must merge into it. Just as if you were to imagine traffic, merging, right? If this is coming and this is coming, well, you can't see on the screen, right? But if this is coming and this is coming, well, then this will always, the lesser gives way to the greater. It has to merge there in that sense. So we don't have time to go into the details of it. This would be for our ethics course, but basically it's saying that you're not choosing the lesser of two evils because they're both good, right? Uh, obeying the government would be to fulfill a scriptural mandate and being f uh, faithful to God would be a uh, scriptural mandate, right? An absolute. And you're not, to obey the government wouldn't be to do a bad thing, it'd be to do a good thing. But in this case, the better, right, would be to be faithful to God. So it's not you're doing the lesser of two evils, it's that you're choosing the greater of two goods, right? Again, so you're not do choosing the lesser of two evils, 
you are choosing the greater of two goods, right? Or even more, possibly more if, if more were in conflict there. Um, so again, we could say a lot in regard to his notable or notable ideas, significant ideas or, and or arguments. Um, I, we'll just let the apologetics community talk about the arguments, right? There's just so much of that that we could go again. If you're an apologetics junkie, I've been throwing that word around a lot this this course. Um, but if you're an apologetics junkie, um, then you already know the con contributions in regard to just apologetics, and they're not even just strictly related to philosophy uh, uh, questions, philosophy of religion. I mean, he's doing stuff in uh, he's got arguments in regard to. Uh, the reliability of the New Testament, um, to the resurrection of Christ, to uh, um, the truthfulness of the accounts of the, of the Scripture, all those sorts of things, right? Um, however, what I, this, this, this nugget, this kernel, that's really a neat uh, philosophical contribution is that his, his remarks on graded, again, his, this ethical theory called graded absolutism. Now, as we look at his significant works, this, we're going to exact. We're going to find ourselves in the same difficulty as we did in the previous section. It's not that there's not enough or any. It's going to be that there's so much we don't know what to do with them, right? In a course like this, when we talk about, well, what are his significant works? Well, how much time do you got, right? Um, if you took the philosophy of religion class, um, that particular textbook, his his philosophy of religion textbook that he did with a. Uh, uh, Corderon, um, co-authored with Corderon, that he, uh, that's been given high marks in, in, in uh, the philosophy of religion, um, in the, within the discipline of philosophy of religion. No matter which stripe, most respect that textbook. That's been a very significant work. Um, another significant work would be, again, his Christian ethics um, uh, book. Uh, another significant work would be his uh, uh famous or infamous, depending on which side of the aisle you're on there, um, is the Christian apologist, simply titled Christian Apologetic. Um, that was a monumental um, work in its day and age. Um, and, and when I say day and age, I mean still having impact. It was one of the first uh, uh, truly uh, highly academic, highly rigorous uh, apologetic works. Um, it, it, if you know anything about his, his, his apologetic methodology, um, this would be another significant idea or argument, but it would fit here because he puts it into an academic work, um, that it takes that, that 12 step approach, right? Beginning from the very, from the ground level up, right? Literally with the very of discussion on whether or not we can know truth, right? And how do we determine, um, what we do know about reality? Can we know reality? Um, way on down the line to arguing that Jesus rose from the dead. It starts literally from the, the metaphysical ground, right, of do we even know the truth? Can we even know truth? Um, so he starts way down the line, works all the way up. Can we know the truth uh, about anything? Why should we believe anything? Um, can we know truths about God? Does God exist? Um, all, just all the way up the ladder there, all the way up the spectrum. Um, he's also got a book called If God, Why Evil? Um, just another uh, treatment on another topic that's been significant because it's offering, again, it's offering kind of a different voice than, uh, say, someone like Alvin Plantinga, which is a very popular um, response to the problem of evil. The philosophical problem of evil is usually given by uh, Plantinga or even philosophers or religion will either, even point to Plantinga as, as, as talking about that problem. But he gives a different idea. Again, this goes back to our schools of thought here um, in regard to the problem of evil. And that textbook or that little, it's not little, but it's not large either. It's just a book called If God, Why Evil? I mean, that's another board. Um, some, of, some of his significant works would be uh, his uh, Baker Encyclopedia. I've got it over here somewhere. Baker Encyclopedia of Christian Apologetics. Um, I mean, that's a massive volume. Um, that has almost every topic that you could possibly imagine in it, whether they just be uh, evidences, historical, this, that, and the other. Um, and then, of course, f issues in philosophy, even down to individual philosophers, right? Like uh, someone is, is like, like Wittgenstein, right? I mean, you've, you've got an entry in an apologetics book about Wittgenstein, the philosopher, right? Um, again, so it, it just is all over the place. He's, he's got so much out there. Um, I'm looking at a book down here 
literally just stuffed under the desk on ancient uh, philosophy and modern and contemporary philosophy. Um, he's written on extensively on that. Um, over here uh, behind me, you, I don't think, believe you can see in the screen there, just a massive uh, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, yeah, four, four volume set in systematic theology. So it's not even just apologetics or philosophy. Um, he's got this uh, four volume systematic uh, theology. I think it's been combined. Uh, I think you can actually find that in one volume now, though it doesn't inc uh, include a lot of the appendices at the end of the book. Uh, but it's the, that, right? Um, a notable significant work would be that he's founded a couple different seminaries, right? I mean, he, he founded uh, Southern Evangelical Seminary. Um, he founded Veritas uh, Seminary. Um, I, he's all over the place, right? Just doing stuff like this. Um, now, that's not to say that he is well loved by everyone, right? He's he's like a lot of other individuals. You know, he's got his he's got his his quirks and his issues that uh, rub people the wrong, wrong way. But it just can't be argued um, that the man has had a massive, massive impact on apologetics and the philosophy of religion. Um, it, it just simply can't be, it just cannot be overstated. Again, whether people end up becoming a fan or not, if you're into apologetics, if you're into philosophy of religion, then he's, he's, there's gonna be his fingerprints somewhere within your walk uh, where he's impacted you. Um, if you happen to like Frank Turek, right, the, the, the uh, the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. All that is is Geisler's 12-point um, apologetic, right, from his Christian apologetics text there. Um, all that, that's, that's basically just put into a popularized format by one of his students, Frank Turek, um, who, had, who now has a massive uh, apologetics ministry, uh, Cross-Examined, um, I believe, is the name of that. Um, again, just another student of Geisler and then uh, that text, I don't have enough faith to be atheist, just put into um, a popular or lay level understanding of Geisler's more academic treatment of the exact same topics in Christian apologetics, um, the textbook Christian apologetics. Now, we could go on and on, but we're not. <laughs> now, notable or significant debates. Um, he's debated in every state in the United States. Um, he has debated uh, the president of the American Atheists. He's uh, debated virtually any uh, who's who on uh, whether they be uh, high up academically uh, in the atheistic realm or even just uh, on the lay level. Someone like um, um, oh, the Dan Barker, that's the name I was looking for. So someone that's even influential, uh, influential in the atheistic uh, uh, world atheistic circles, but not necessarily academic. Someone like Dan Barker debated him. Uh, uh, Michael Constantine Kalinda, um, if I'm pronouncing that name correctly. Um, he's debated, um, who's another? Just so many, uh, just, just so many. Uh, who is the secular humanist um, that came up with the Humanist Manifesto? name just completely escapes my mind right now. Uh, I remember watching that debate. Uh, Mark Linville, right? We were talking about last course, or last, uh, not course, last lecture. Uh, Mark Linville uh, was giving me just a, a, a personal story about picking uh, Geisler up for some debate that was held at, at Linville's, uh, during Lin Linville's graduate days uh, in college. And Mark Linville arrives to pick up the debate the, the, the theist, and it's Norman Geisler, right? <laughs> He's riding around in the car, you know, all over the place uh, with Geisler taking him to the debate and whatnot. Um, he's, the, the, the significant debates, obviously, we could talk about uh, because there's so many, but let's just go ahead and look at this presentation thing because we just mentioned that last topic here. Um, and probably one of his most significant uh, in the uh, parenthetical Part right there it would be just this uh, this this uh, twelve points that show Christianity is true, because 
before it was dubbed, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. Geisler would go around to college campuses and uh, locales, and he would give a presentation that was called 12 points that show Christianity to be true. And you'll notice that I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. That text is just 12 points, right? There's, I think there's um, each chapter coincides with those points or whatnot. If you don't include like conclusions or introductions and things like that. Um, so if you follow that type of apologetic methodology, something like the classical system of, of, of apologetics, uh, if you're called a classical apologist, uh, then you're very likely walking in those 12 points, right? Those, those 12 steps, again, which would be, um, why should anyone believe anything at all? Uh, how do we know what is true? How do we know the truth exists? Um, how do we know that God exists? Um, all, all the way up until the resurrection, right? To argue for the truthfulness of the resurrection of Christ. Um, again, massive impact even on, on me. Um, and how I began my approach uh, in philosophy of religion and apologetics. Now, Geisler is also, he's, he's one of, going to be one of the few, he's going to be one of the few that comes from a school of thought called Thomism. Um, Geisler identifies as a, 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 as a Thomist, as an Aristotelian Thomist. Uh, now, that's not to say that he, oh, excuse me, that's not to say that he, agrees with all things Thomist. So for instance, when we go, if we went back to our earlier Christian thinker, Ed Fazer, he is staunchly, radically Thomist. Um, he's not going to depart uh, from Thomism in ver almost any subject, right? Well, any realm of discussion, I should say it that way. Ge Geisler may do that here and there, um, but he's one of the, uh, the uh, Renaissance thinkers in uh, that kind of just launched launched again Christians that were philosophical and Thomas Geisler had a big part in that um, coming out of you could argue um, out of Loyola right a, a Catholic uh, institution there um, of course we could argue that more in depth or, or less in depth depending on the on the detail um, that we were able to glean uh, but to, Geisler comes from the Thomistic school of thought. Um, he's going to argue heavily for divine simplicity, uh, which is a, a doctrine that is, is on very rough times, to put it bluntly, uh, in, in our current day and age. Um, and when I say that, I say it as class, divine, simplicity, divine simplicity, the doctrine is classically understood. Um, so, for instance, William Lane Craig would argue for divine simplicity, except he redefines what is meant by uh, divine simplicity. So... Uh, classically, someone like Geisler here in the school of thought of Thomism would argue that divine simplicity is, is it means that God is simple in the sense that he has no attributes or properties, um, but the, he is one and attributes or properties are simply are basically the language that we would are forced to use because we ourselves are contingent and we ourselves are composite creatures. But in reality, there is no composition. Um, there is no difference between God's justice and God's love on the classical doctrine of divine simplicity. Um, Craig would say that God is simple, but God's justice is not God's love, right? That those are really two different properties or really two different and distinct um, attributes. Uh, the classical notion of divine simplicity that Geisler would argue for um, is that no God's love just is God's justice, which is just is God's truth, which just which just is God's uh, you know on and on and on, um, which all are His existence in some sense. Again, very hard times. The classical doctrine of divine simplicity has fallen on very hard times. But Geisler's going to argue from argue that from the school of thought of the traditional Thomistic notion. Now. We could say some more about Geisler, and you know, obviously, we've got a discussion post that you can that you can uh, interact with anything that I've said thus far, or even uh, talk about a, a different contribution that you'd like to um, uh, toss in, right? Toss in the arena there on the discussion posts, or of course, we're in our class, right? So you can, if you're if you're one that uh, Geisler has <laughs> aggravated you in some sense, 
uh, then of course you're free to engage with that, right? You're free to to speak about that as well. Just of course we want to do so respectfully, right? Um, but having said that, this will conclude another one of our brief overviews of different Christian thinkers of significance, and I will see you next time.